A BBC Panorama investigation into the rise of online abuse against women has revealed how social media companies are using algorithms to promote misogynistic hate and failing to act when it's reported. Our disinformation reporter Mariana Spring has been to meet politicians, Love Island contestants and a frontline doctor to explore the impact of online hate on women who use social media to do their job. Kaz was a contestant on Love Island earlier this year. As a social media influencer, she now has 850,000 followers on Instagram. Although she gets lots of love on social media, she also gets a lot of hate. My Instagram, that's my workplace. No one walks into their office and has people yelling abuse at them, do they? So why should it be the same thing on my Instagram? The think tank Demos has looked at the abuse received by both male and female contestants on Love Island and another reality TV show. They studied more than 90,000 posts and comments and found women got far more abuse than men. People were using explicitly gendered slurs, women being manipulative, women being sneaky, women being uh, sexual and women being evil or stupid. Politicians are also targeted, with some female MPs saying they constantly receive violent and sexualised abuse online. Before social media existed, you know, somebody could get done for being threatening, for being threatening in the street, for being threatening in real life, for some of the things that they said and, and the hate speech that they had. Um, the fact that they're talking directly to someone online, the fact that it's through the medium of their phone, doesn't stop that being threatening. As the BBC's specialist disinformation reporter, I also get a lot of abuse. So I'm recording this uh, because last night I got some of the worst abuse that I've um, received doing this job really, I mean I'm quite used to getting it now. All the main social media companies say they don't promote hate on their platforms and take action to stop it. To test this, Panorama set up a fake profile of a man who'd already shown some hostility to women on his profile and found Facebook and Instagram recommended him more and more anti-women content, some involving sexual violence. This profile, if it were a real person, would have been brought into a hateful community full of misogynistic content very, very quickly within two weeks. Facebook, which also owns Instagram, says it tries not to recommend content that breaks its rules and is improving its technology to find and remove abuse more quickly. They've just announced new measures to tackle sexualised hate targeting journalists, politicians and celebrities. It comes at a time when women are increasingly standing up against hate and violence, both online and in the real world. I am just as human as you, and it hurts me in the same way as this would hurt you, and I would never wish for anyone to experience it. I would never wish that at all. Mariana Spring, BBC News. Live now to Chloe Colliver. She leads a team of analysts studying disinformation. We just saw her there in Mariana's report. Good to see you, Chloe. Can you firstly give us your view and through your research as to why it is that women receive so much more of this kind of hate online than men? Thanks for having me. I think we have to take a step back and see that social media didn't create misogyny, but what it's done is it's hypercharged existing trends that disproportionately target women. Women have always been the victims and targets of violence and hate. And these platforms and services have been designed and built in such a way that the online experience exacerbates and makes that experience worse for women who were already receiving this kind of attention offline. So Chloe, what policies do social media companies have in place right now to try and counter this and get a grip of this? Most of the major companies, so Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, Google, will have policies on hate speech, on targeted abuse and on threats. But the problem isn't necessarily in the wording of the policies, it's really in the enforcement gap. There is not enough resource and there is no incentive for these platforms to comprehensively and transparently enforce those policies. So we're seeing them missing things and failing all over the place in terms of protecting their users uh, from these kind of direct attacks. Chloe, presumably they use quite a lot of AI to try and track algorithms and things, but is it possible for the AI to be clever enough to see some of this more personalised misogynistic kind of language? You're exactly right. They use two things. They use users reporting content themselves manually and AI to try and detect abusive content automatically. From our own research, we've seen how difficult it is to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to try to detect 
harassment and abuse because it is such a personalized form of harm uh, to the individual being targeted. So there is no real transparency on how they're training their AI, how effective it is, what it's missing or what it might be wrongly detecting as harassment and abuse as well. And do you believe, Chloe, that these online platforms have an incentive to deal with this, uh, you know, genuine will uh, and desire to improve this? At the bottom line at the moment, these companies are only really driven by profits. And at the moment, that means that as long as advertisers continue to pay to sell ads on these platforms, there's no real incentive to change what's going on. Uh, so we really need to see regulators, democratic governments step up and uh, provide incentives that mean that companies have to put safety first rather than profits. And that's what the UK government looks set to do with the new online safety bill that's currently being debated across Parliament. Is anything happening in this space that is working? Are there any platforms right now that are actually managing to tackle this? There are certainly platforms that have tried to be more proactive in providing users and women, especially with, with tools or services on, on their products that might help. Twitter, for example, has trialed mute buttons or blocking buttons, or also um, kind of uh, you can only uh, reply to your friends if you select that option. So there are things that certain platforms like Twitter are trying to do to give the users themselves a bit more control over what they see and who can talk to them. But that always puts the onus back on the victim. So the problem here is we need to find solutions that don't rely on the victim to be uh, making the problem better for themselves. Really interesting to talk to you, Chloe. Thanks so much for joining us.